Uh, welcome to this episode of Green Left TV. We're here today with um, Kavita Krishnan, um, a leader of the Communist Party of India Marxist Leninist. Kavita has recently been on a, a fact finding mission to, um, to Kashmir. As um, people will know, we've been hearing reports at least about a severe crackdown by the far right wing uh, Modi government of, of, of India. And this has involved, uh, the reports we've heard, heard include um, cutting telephones, cutting internet, uh, total curfew, mass arrest of political leaders. Can you tell us what you saw with your eyes on, your, on the fact-finding mission and tell us about the fact-finding mission itself? Sure, Alex. So I had gone on behalf of uh, my party, the Communist Party of India, Marxist-Leninist, the PIML, and with, with me there was the economist Jean Dres and there was also uh, Memo Namulla, who's from the Communist Party of India, Marxist, and a women's organization, ETWA. And there was someone from the National Alliance of People Movement, Vimal Bhai. So the four of us, basically, we just felt that uh, since, uh, you know, the whole of Kashmir had been muzzled and uh, the decision of the Modi government was being celebrated and it was being claimed that uh, Kashmiris are celebrating. But, uh, you know, there were no Kashmiri voices on the uh, on the ground that were being uh, heard or seen at all. Go. And the situation there is extremely grim. As you just said, uh, the entire, I mean, I would say the whole of Kashmir is one big prison in which there is a CRPF, that is paramilitary deployment everywhere. Uh, so it's not just police, it's paramilitary deployment everywhere. Young children as young as uh, uh, nine or 10 years old have been arrested, uh, not even arrested. They've been picked up uh, illegally detained by the police or by army in army camps or police stations. They're being beaten up and uh, you know there's no law so it's uh, it's, it's it's against india's own constitution and law as well and as you said there's a complete communication blockade so it is not just that uh you know you can't use landline phone uh, that's the first time that landline phones have ever been banned in india in any part in you know by an indian government anywhere all right and so that is there you can't use mobile phones and uh, people queue up to try and use satellite phones that the police are able to use and uh, so they have to beg the police for the right to use those and uh, there is uh, and there's even it's difficult even to move from one street to another so uh, people uh, do not know what is happening in the next village they don't know what is happening in the next district people in rural Kashmir uh, southern Kashmir don't know what's happening in Srinagar so uh, they're reliant on their news for the national uh, Indian media and the national channels that run from Delhi are running news that is uh, adding insult to injury because essentially they are being uh, they are continuously broadcasting that the Kashmiris are so happy and that it's a great thing for uh, Kashmir and that this will liberate Kashmiri women and um, you know all kinds of complete nonsense like that. So uh, we managed to speak to many people and their fear and their anger and their sense of uh, helplessness was all, um, you know, something that we were witness to, including on the day of the festival of Eid, uh, Eid al Adha, which is the uh, festival of the sacrifice, uh, you know, the Eid uh, sacrifice, where, um, and it's a festival, and there was no festive atmosphere at all. So we are citizens of India, and of course, uh, there is good reason for Kashmiri people to feel uh, suspicious of. Uh, what we represent so they said you know we've spoken to indian fact finding teams we've uh indian meaning uh mainland india right so when they say we've spoken to fact finding teams from delhi before we have spoken to media from delhi before and uh they've never represented our truth and so we are suspicious and they would say all of that and they would also give us you know long history lessons uh which every child in kashmir would sit us down and tell us you don't know anything and let me let me explain to you but after all that, they, they offered, they extended such warmth and such hospitality to us that we were really moved and, in fact, really ashamed because uh, in these times of extreme hardship, uh, when their shops are not open and they are barely able to get by themselves, they would insist and at the very least, you know, giving us tea and things to drink and offering us lunch and offering us food and offering uh, to host us in their homes and all of that. So that's the situation. There have also been protests. So where there have been protests, uh, the CRPF, uh, the paramilitary has used pellet guns, which are basically guns, you know, hunting guns for use against animals in hunting. And so they are used uh, against Kashmiri people for a very long time now. 
and this time also we could meet people young boys whose um, faces and eyes have been injured by pellet guns and uh, pellet guns are being deliberately aimed uh, at the eyes not only of uh, you know of, of anybody of a bystander somebody standing at their door um, somebody who argues with this uh, paramilitary a little bit about how they're behaving or uh, just uh, you know peaceful protesters as well could you perhaps tell an australian audience just a brief history about kashmir and its relationship with india uh, yeah so even the very basics of um, this history is being are being distorted by uh, the Indian media today and the Indian government today. So I do want to summarize very briefly that in 1947 August, um, India won independence from uh, British rule. And as we know from history, uh, that independence came with a partition between India and Pakistan. So Pakistan and India were both created as new nations at that time. And then uh, there was also a, uh, you know, a lot of negotiation and uh, through negotiation, there was a division of uh, territory between India and Pakistan. So when the lines were drawn, then of course, um, you know, what was then called East Bengal was went to Pakistan. Why? Why did East Bengal go to Pakistan? Which is Bangladesh today, right? The reason was because Muslim majority areas were generally granted to Pakistan as uh, Muslim majority areas on the border were granted to Pakistan. So, um, you know, so uh, the, the, the issue was that if uh, uh, the, most of the border areas with the Muslim majority, uh, they were anyway, in any case, they went to Pakistan. Apart from that, there were a lot of princely states, what were basically small royal principalities um, over which the British had control, but which now essentially, you know, earlier they had been you know, like small royalty, royal states, right? So the kings of those uh, places then had a choice to go with Pakistan, to go with India, or to remain independent. And what uh, the Indian uh, government did at that time was to try and negotiate with as many of them as possible. So they were, and so Jammu and Kashmir was one such royal principality, which had the frequent situation of having a Hindu king ruling it, but its population was Muslim majority, but Kashmiris are both Muslim and Hindu. So the Kashmiri population there which did not uh, just think of themselves in terms of being Muslim or Hindu, but they were Muslim majority. Now, in October 1947, uh, there were certain uh, tribes of people who, uh, backed by Pakistan, attacked Jammu and Kashmir and tried to annex it. So when that happened, uh, Maharaja Hari Singh, who was the ruler of Jammu and Kashmir, he rushed to India uh, to find an instrument of accession. Which instrument of accession clearly says, if you read it, it clearly says that, uh, well, this is only a very temporary agreement and there is no, and there is nothing that binds me, meaning uh, the ruler as the representative of the country to the Indian constitution. Okay, that said in so many words. Now the people of Jammu and Kashmir and their leader, uh, their leader uh, Sheikh Abdullah, at that time, uh, they uh, basically wanted to come. Um, you know, they at that time felt that their Kashmiri identity and autonomy might be safer uh, in a secular, federal, democratic India rather than a an a, a theocratic Pakistan. Yes, so Kashmir's autonomy represented by Article 370 has been completely whittled away uh, to uh, basically there are only there were only the threads or the symbol of it remaining. It had been evacuated of its uh, substance uh, over the years. And uh, essentially, if you look at what Indian constitutional scholar A.G. Nurani says, he says that uh, far from enjoying a special status in terms of a privileged status, Jammu and Kashmir, uh, in fact, enjoyed a far less autonomy than other Indian states. In fact, uh, he says that uh, no other state has been subjected to the kind of debasement and humiliation that Jammu and Kashmir faced, including the arbitrary arrest and incarceration of their popular leader, Sheikh uh, Muhammad Abdullah, uh, for such a long time. And uh, since then, any government in uh, Jammu and Kashmir has been a government that has been controlled by the central government. And so increasingly in Jammu and Kashmir, there was a sense that elections should be boycotted, that those parties that participated in elections were basically, uh, you know, agents of India and uh, they were not, uh, you know, so they would be arguing for remaining with India and for Article 370 and all of that. But today, what the Indian government has done, see, in every international forum where India would have to stay, you know, uh, argue its claim for Kashmir uh, with Pakistan because it's a dispute between India and Pakistan. And uh, clearly it's also a dispute in which the Kashmiri people and their will, they have a say. 
So whenever India would argue, India would show, would showcase Article 370. They would say, look, there are elections in Jammu and Kashmir. People are voting. There is Article 370, which is a part of India's constitution, which binds Kashmir to India and all of that, right? Now the Modi government has done away with that, you know, fig leaf, if you call it that. They have done away with whatever tattered part of Article 370 was remaining. And so what does that mean? The Kashmiri people we met are all saying, they all know this history, you know, like the back of their palms, okay? So every child there was telling us that, look, this means that now we are being held against our will. Now uh, that contract, that was a contract between, they kept explaining to us, they said, do you understand contract? It's like a marriage contract, one of them said. So they said, you know, uh, this is like a contract. So now India has unilaterally divorced us. They have severed that relationship. And now they, it's like they've locked us up without a will, without even consulting our elected assembly. Now, I just, if you have time, I just want to quickly explain that the Indian government says, oh, Article 370 was a temporary provision. Now, I'll tell you in what sense it was temporary and what sense it was permanent. Uh, uh, so repeatedly, Indian Supreme Courts have held, constitutional courts of India have held, that in, in fact, in effect, Article 370 was a um, permanent provision. Why? Because unlike similar articles which are uh, existing, uh, which give various uh, you know, provisions to protect the uh, specific identities and rights of in other Indian states, Jammu Kashmir's uh, Article 370 um, uh, was backed by, uh, you know, as part of Article 370, it was said that the only way Article 370 can be amended or gotten rid of is by a constituent assembly of the state of Jammu and Kashmir state. Okay. So a state constituent assembly, which means a state assembly that can, uh, that is not just any old elected legislative assembly, but an assembly that can form a new constitution for Jammu and Kashmir. Okay. Now, the last state constituent assembly ceased to exist in 1954. So uh, essentially what the Indian courts have held repeatedly is that since there is no new constitution, until and unless there is another constituent assembly form, you cannot get rid of Article 370. So for, for all purposes, it is a permanent provision. Now, what the Indian government has just done is to say, all right, uh, there's no constituent assembly, but legislative assembly is good enough. But Kashmir right now, Jammu and Kashmir has no legislative assembly either because uh, the assembly was um, illegally dissolved by the BJP uh, in a, a government at the center in 2018. And elections were due in 2019 along with India's parliamentary elections. And the government did not hold elections in 2019. Rather, the election commission did not hold elections because it is completely controlled by the central government. So all this is quite deliberate. They've really been planning this for a while there, right? And then they are saying that the governor can represent the will of the Kashmiri people. Who's this governor? He's not Kashmiri. The governor is a representative of the Indian central government in India's various states. And so the governor to Jammu and Kashmir, so the Indian central government is using its own representative's voice to claim, you know, to stand in for the will of Kashmiri people. And this is absurd, all right? This is completely absurd and it's an insult. It's, it's an insult to uh, the intelligence of all of us and especially to that of Kashmiri people. Um, so basically, India has hacked at its own legitimacy. It has essentially uh, dealt its own claims over Kashmir up to low, uh, even if you look at it in those terms. And not only that, they are using basically military power to hold, uh, hold, uh, hold Kashmir captive now and to silence all Kashmiri voices of uh, protest against this or Kashmiri voices of dissent against this. And they're branding Indian voices like ourselves as anti-national, and we are being threatened with um, violence by the uh, uh, Hindu majoritarian right-wing fascist group or, by, or with arrest by the government. So why do you think this, the Modi government is, uh, is taking this move at the moment? Is this just a reflection of its uh, overall conservative politics or is there some other reason? Um, there have been several speculations about the reasons. One is, as you know, there is a Pakistan, uh, there is an Afghanistan peace process that's going on, and India wants to upstage Pakistan. There, Pakistan is kind of getting ahead of India. There, it's, uh, so they want the U.S. to see Pakistan as a problem. So they were, pro they may have been hoping that this move may provoke Pakistan into some kind of armed attack or whatever armed response. 
and then uh, they could uh, tell the US uh, that, oh, look, Pakistan is misbehaving or whatever it is and get a greater stay in the Afghan peace process. That's one option. But I, to my mind, I think the plan is in fact something uh, far more integral to uh, the way in which the BJP and its parent fascist organization, the Rashtriya Swamsed of Sangh, the RSS, think about this region. One is that in their ideo it's, it's very much in line with their ideological vision. Their ad ideological vision is that not only India as it stands now, the geographical territory that India, but India, Kashmir, uh, Pak uh, India including Kashmir, as well as Pakistan, as well as Afghanistan, as well as Bangladesh, as well as Nepal, all these are part of what they call Akhand Bharat, which is undivided, um, uh, you know, undivided uh, Hindu India. Okay, so they believe that India is a Hindu nation or should be a Hindu nation that encompasses all of this, and this should be a place where Hindus have first right of way, and Muslims have to live as a subjugated, a subordinate population, much uh, which their leaders of the RSS in the 1930s and 40s explicitly compared to how Jews were treated in Hitler's Germany or how the blacks were treated in uh, black people, the African-Americans were treated in 1930s uh, USA or uh, to how uh, Palestinians are treated in Israel today. So these are the models that they have in mind. So I think that this uh, manner in which uh, Article 370 was advocated by this government is something which uh, is a first step in the direction of turning India into uh, a de, not just a de facto Hindu nation, but a de jure Hindu, Hindu nation. When I say de facto, I mean um, not that India is a Hindu nation, but that in the last five years of the first uh, tenure of Mr. Modi, um, India has already moved in that direction. It's been pushed in that direction, but not uh, really the law, right? It's been moved in that direction by lynch mobs that are killing uh, people with impunity, killing Muslim people with impunity, and enforcing, uh, you know, the law uh, in, enforcing ideas like, oh, Muslims should not be allowed to eat beef, Muslims should not be allowed to marry Hindu women and all of that. Although this is no, this has no place in the law. Now they want to go to changing the law. Uh, yeah, so the, in the last few years, the Indian media has been portraying Kashmir and Kashmiris as being anti-India because they are Muslim. And Muslims anyway, uh, they don't really belong in India. Their hearts are with Pakistan. And Kashmir is the biggest example of this. This is the way in which the Indian media, much of the Indian media has been propagating uh, what's been happening in Kashmir. And so they've been whipping up the hatred against Kashmir and Kashmiris. And of course, against Muslims in um, you know, all, of, all of India as well. So what this government has done is that they have done what was for them the easiest thing to do in terms of Indian public opinion. So they have taken this really disastrous step if you look at it from conventional Indian uh, policy, Kashmir policy, it is pretty disastrous and stupid. Because as I said, you've destroyed what was your own uh, sole remaining legal claim to Kashmir. Okay, So you, you destroyed that. But they don't really care because they're feeling, uh, Mr. Modi has just said that, look, not a single country has spoken out um, against, um, against uh, our move here. Putin is supporting us. Trump is supporting us. Everyone is supporting us. All right. So there is, uh, so he is able to claim that because uh, India is seen as a market by all these countries, and they are least bothered about, uh, you know, the actual legitimacy of what the Indian government is doing, and international law and UN and all of that. You know, that's that's basically a dead letter. So uh, that's one thing, and they feel that they can do politics in the rest of India by showing what they've done in Kashmir as a victory over a rebellious Muslim principality. So King Modi has uh, conquered. Uh, this, uh, uh, you know, this rebellious territory that did not want to integrate with India. He, it's like he's an emperor who has established his uh, control over this um, re uh, rebellious Muslim territory, right? So it's also seen as a, uh, you know, poke in the eye for Pakistan and all of that. So he's able to play that really well here. But what I feel is that the next steps, you know, if, if people have to watch what's going to happen in India, very soon, the final list of what is called the National Register of Citizens in uh, the state of Assam in India, uh, Northeast India, uh, is being going to be published, which um, under which they are going to release, uh, they're going to claim that lakhs of people are essentially, the Indian government will declare them Bangladeshi. Bangladesh will, has not recognized them. There is no treaty with Bangladesh to recognize them as migrants, immigrants from Bangladesh. And so essentially, they will be reduced to stateless citizens. They may not all be Muslim or, but, uh, or Bengali speaking, 
but it's very likely that a large number of them will be linguistic or um, um, faith minority. All right. So this person who is the Indian Home Minister has referred to uh, these potentially stateless people as termites. So it's dehumanizing language. And he has promised to extend this national register of citizens to all of India. And he has said we'll also change the definition of Indian citizenship, which will allow us to declare um, non-Muslim um, refugees or migrants from India's neighboring countries as Indian citizens. So Hindus who migrate from Bangladesh will be given citizenship. But Muslims, every Muslim, every Indian Muslim will be asked to prove that their ancestors are, were really Indian, as in before 1951, that they were really Indian. Okay. So this is a scary situation. Um, if there are any children watching this, please remember your Harry Potter. Please remember, you know, those lists of uh, who are truly Muggleborns and who are, uh, who are, uh, you know, who are uh, truly wizards and all of that. It's something like that. This is a listing that's happening, that's going to happen. And this will render every Muslim in India vulnerable. And it will uh, already India's first concentration camps are in place where in Assam, where people who are accused, who are, uh, you know, they're called doubtful voters. They're called D voters, doubtful voters. They are being held in inhuman conditions, terribly inhuman conditions. And uh, even India's Supreme Court is completely unsympathetic here and has been referring to them, has been calling for even more inhumane measures against uh, these people. And, um, you know, this is likely to extend to all of India. So that will be step number two. And I believe that in step number three, and I'll end my remarks there, I believe that in step number three, the way in which uh, this government refers to Article 370 as a temporary provision, we should remember that their party and their organization, fascist organization, has referred to protections extended to um, affirmative action extended to uh, India's uh, oppressed castes and uh, indigenous people, Adivasis and Dalits, as um, also a temporary provision. So caste-based reservation for the SCs and STs, scheduled castes and scheduled tribes in India. This government, is, uh, is parent party, has a parent organization, has repeatedly said that those provisions should have been done away with uh, within 10 years of India's getting independence um, and they passed their expiry date. So tomorrow they're going to come for those things. They already come for India's labor laws. They're going to come for India's, uh, you know, women's rights that India, uh, India's women have won to such, uh, with such difficulty. Um, all, they, all they're going to essentially move India and they may not declare India to be a Hindu nation and they don't need to. They may continue to hold elections, but under such, such circumstances, that essentially minorities in India, as well as those like us who are dissenting voices or dissenting you know, fighting people, whether it's workers or peasants or um, you know, Dalit or uh, any any anybody who's basically uh, speaking up against uh, the uh, the ideology of a Hindu nation, we are all going to be declared as anti-Indian, and maybe uh, they already have laws in place, draconian laws under which they can arrest all of us. So uh, all this is going to happen. So I can, you know, I can only <laughs> tell all of you about it and, uh, you know, call for solidarity. Yeah. Yes, well, that's a pretty um, grim picture that you've painted. Uh, so I guess my final question is, well, what is the pathway to justice? What is a just solution? What needs to be done? And how can people in other parts of the world be of assistance, give solidarity? Two things. Um, I, um, one thing is vis-a-vis -vis Kashmir, of course, uh, the international uh, society should have a very strong voice on this. Uh, if international governments are not speaking um, uh, about India's blatant violation of international law as well as India's own constitution, then uh, people in various countries should protest and should demand that their governments take a position on the situation in Kashmir. So please do, do, do that. But also, I would say that the image that this uh, government and Mr. Modi are building for themselves, you know, you have Discovery Channel and Bear Grylls uh, doing a program with Mr. Modi and, uh, you know, so building this uh, image of Mr. Modi. You have Obama, when he was president, writing an op-ed in, I think it was the New York, New York Times. I think it was in uh, support of Mr. Modi and all of this. Uh, so, uh, you know, basically India is being seen as this market and, um, uh, also, there's this re almost racist idea, orientalist idea that, oh, Indian politics is really too complicated to understand. And so uh, you have the German ambassador to India, can you believe it, meeting India's fascist organization, going and touching the feet, paying his respects 
to the founder, the fascist founder of that organization that openly took uh, inspiration from the German Nazi. You know, irony could not get any, uh, you know, could, uh, irony could just, just go commit suicide, you know, it was really awful. So um, you know, we, we've been petitioning also for uh, that ambassador to be withdrawn. Um, so international, all of you could also take up that issue and say, you know, ask Germany, what on earth is your ambassador doing endorsing fascism? All right. Uh, the other thing to do is to also um, basically uh, expose what Mr. Modi is about. You in Australia, all of you in Australia know uh, Modi's relationship with Adani. Adani is destroying, uh, you know, sensitive ecosystems, uh, the coral, uh, bar the Great Barrier Reef in Australia with Mr. Modi's help, right? Uh, similarly, Mr. Modi is and, Ad and his friend Adani and other industrialists in India are destroying India's forests and in the livelihoods and land of Indian indigenous peoples. So uh, please campaign against Bear Grylls as well. Tell him, you know, you are posing with, in, uh, with Mr. Modi in a forest and you're listening to Mr. Modi, uh, you know, spin all kinds of uh, tall tales about how he, used to, he once lived in a forest of uh, claims for which there is no basis whatsoever. It's all part of the mythology that he builds up. Um, and yet you're not asking him, oh, sir, how come you and your friends are destroying uh, forests and sensitive ecosystems like the Great Barrier Reef, uh, coral reefs like that? How, how come that's happening? Maybe campaigns like that, campaigns that uh, chip away at this image that Mr. Modi is trying to build as a elected rep representative of the largest democracy in the world. Um, so, you know, I feel disturbed when I see people like Trevor Noah, who is the who is the uh, comic, uh, you know, the stand up comic, do programs, do programs in which he compares Imran Khan, of uh, the prime minister of Pakistan, with uh, Donald Trump. The apt comparison would be with Mr. Modi, because Mr. Modi's politics is far closer to Trump's politics, uh, you know, xenophobic and anti-Muslim politics than Imran Khan's is. Um, you know, I know the stuff that uh, he said about Imran Khan was, in fact, not particularly accurate at all. Uh, Mr. Modi's politics is much more. Uh, and yet uh, there are no shows like that that are done. Uh, there's, there's very little exposure. So even shows that are done are really careful. I've seen Hassan Minhaj's show on Indian elections and all. So while that was not so bad, and he did mention this fascist organization, but he was so careful that uh, really the whole enormity of what's happening in India is not coming out. India, this is 1930s Germany unfolding in front of the noses of the world out here in India. So please speak up everybody and, uh, you know, uh, highlight it. I, I'm speaking to you now literally with a, a television channel last night in India, which is a propaganda channel for the government, as most of them are, uh, having run an entire show targeting me and the other three activists who went, especially me, and asking why we haven't been locked up and basically uh, almost uh, seeking people on to attack us in public. Okay, so essentially inciting violence against us and inciting uh, you know, demand of uh, inside creating a ground creating a consensus for the government to basically uh, brand us as uh, sympathizers of terrorists and arrest us so our solidarity and sympathy with the people of kashmir is being construed as disloyalty to india uh dissent against the hindu hindu uh, majoritarian fascist government disloyalty to india uh, my talking to you here in Australia will be construed as disloyalty to India because I'm washing dirty linen in public and, uh, you know, uh, just as women are told. Um, yeah, so I should add one little detail, Alex, that you may find, uh, you know, intriguing. This whole claim, you know, just like the U.S. claimed when they were so-called liberating Afghanistan uh, while occupying Afghanistan, that they were uh, liberating Afghanistan's women, remember, from the Taliban. Now... You have the Modi government claiming they're liberating Kashmiri women. We met Kashmiri girls and women who told us that, look, of course, we all have our patriarchies and uh, kindly allow us to fight our own battles on our own and also fight alongside our brothers and uh, parents and everything uh, against the oppressor. But, uh, and don't uh, our oppressors should not pose as our liberators. But what we were particularly enraged about was that you have leaders of Mr. Modi's party, including elected uh, the elected chief minister of a state bordering Delhi, Haryana. Okay. Uh, Haryana is a state where the sex ratio is especially low and uh, there's a lot of uh, sex selective abortion, so little girls are not born, baby girls are not born. 
uh, so uh, what Mr. Uh, what the Chief Minister there of the BJP has been saying for a long time is that oh, uh, Haryana's men don't have enough, uh, you know, don't have wives. They're not able to get wives there, and of course they're entitled to wives. So earlier he used to say we'll get you wives from Bihar, you know, good quality wives from Bihar and all of that. This BJP leaders have said that. Now this Chief Minister has said, oh, now that Kashmir has been integrated with India, uh, Haryanvi men can get nice, fair, uh, uh, white uh, bride uh, from uh, Kashmir, Kashmiri girls as bride. Uh, basically, this is a rape threat. You know, this is the language of a col uh, colonizing oppressor, which are talking about looting women against their will. And Kashmiri girls and women were saying that these disgusting fellows who are talking about us as though we were apples or peaches of Kashmir, or uh, that they can just come and grab. Uh, these are the ones who are claiming to liberate us. These are the ones who are trying to teach us feminism. You know, uh, they were particularly rude about, <laughs> but they did not mean their words. Kashmiri young people is, uh, and women, uh, there's a far greater level of literacy there uh, and development there than there, there is in most uh, Indian, North Indian states. And uh, so they were particularly annoyed at uh, Modi's, uh, at at one former diplomat, uh, Indian diplomat, Nirupama Menon Rao, writing an op-ed in which he said, oh, Kashmir is 200 years behind India, the, you know, behind the rest of India. This is absolute nonsense, okay? And um, I wish I could use ruder words, but this is absolute, uh, complete nonsense. And uh, Indian uh, and uh, Kashmiri girls and women were particularly enraged about this. Hmm. Well, yeah, that does sound like a very grim situation and I'm I'm you know sorry to be hearing that and I, I guess I would like to call on people listening to this video to actually to do whatever you can to actually help extend solidarity in this um in this important time and uh, yeah take a stand against what is a a an unacknowledged extremely conservative um, you know government a far right government in the in the in the, in the mold of um, Donald Trump and Bolsonaro and Duterte in, in the Philippines and there needs to be a greater a, a greater call of solidarity against that um, conservatism.